Hello, thanks for listening to The Leader. We hope you enjoy hearing the Evening Standard's exclusive news, interviews, commentary and analysis. But you don't have to keep it to yourself. We'd really appreciate it if you could share the podcast with anyone you think might like it. And please do give us a rating and review. It's really helpful to us making it better. And it also shows podcast providers like Apple that people are really listening. So they then promote it to more people and that helps us grow the show. So you can be a big part of our success just by liking, sharing, commenting or reviewing. Thank you. Now, from the Evening Standard in London... This is the leader. Hi, I'm David Marsland. Prince Andrew may be stripped of state security. It's clearly an expensive cost for the taxpayer to fund. That's the, the, the critical thing. Our Home Affairs editor Martin Bentham on the Evening Standard's Royal Exclusive. What does it mean for Prince Harry and Meghan? Also, if there's Godfather Part 1 and Part 2, this is going to be Impeachment Part 1 and Part 2. But Impeachment Part 2 goes to the Senate. The Republicans are in control there. US correspondent David Gardner talks to the leader as the impeachment standoff ends. Donald Trump is going on trial. And for many years, I couldn't call myself a feminist because it was one of those dirty words that nobody wanted to use. Charlie Theron talks to the standard about feminism and her new movie, Bombshell. Taken from the Evening Standard's editorial column, this is the leader. For the whole thing, pick up the newspaper or head to standard.co.uk slash comment. In a moment, Martin Bentham reveals more on that exclusive report into Prince Andrew's police protection. After days hidden from view, Prince Harry was back at work and in front of the world's cameras at Buckingham Palace, hosting the Rugby League World Cup draw. He also released a campaign video for the tournament promoting mental health. Rugby League isn't just a sport, it's a community, and one that takes care of its own. This may well be his last public engagement as a senior royal. The implications of that are still to be decided, particularly over cost. But the Evening Standards revealed there may now be a precedent over security. Sources tell us Prince Andrew, who stepped down in the aftermath of his BBC interview over Jeffrey Epstein, could have his police protection removed. That means the public won't pay for it, and our editorial column thinks that's right. The proposal to remove police protection from Prince Andrew is a sensible reflection of both his altered role and the demands on the public purse that such security entails. While those royals whose official activities project them into the spotlight should be protected in case they become targets for terrorists or others, Those who abandon these tasks should generally be left to look after themselves, as ordinary citizens do. It's true, of course, that Prince Andrew can never escape his royal profile and the potential for attention that this brings. But if he's concerned, then he remains a wealthy man who should be able to pay for his own security detail. A more difficult decision looms over what royal protection the Duke and Duchess of Sussex should retain once they switch to the new role they desire. The same principles should apply. If they are performing royal duties, then they are entitled to protection. But if not, then they should pay for it themselves as part of the financial independence they seek. Our Home Affairs editor Martin Bentham's here. Martin, what kind of protection does Prince Andrew currently have? Uh, Well, he, as we understand it, is one of the internationally protected people who therefore gets, in effect, 24-hour protection, royal protection. Armed officers will be available and they accompany him and other royal family members who are in that category, diplomats, some diplomats as well, wherever they go, in essence, potentially, to ensure their safety. We don't actually know exactly how it's all organised and whether the raw security is there all the time but certainly it's available all the time and it's clearly an expensive cost for the taxpayer to fund that's the 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 critical thing and of course it's it's meant to be there to protect people who are requiring (laughs) that international protection because of their status and their and their role who makes the final decision on this well, ultimately, it's a Home Secretary decision, although, of course, I suppose 
finally it would go to the the prime minister in a situation of great sensitivity but the metropolitan police which provides the officers makes recommendations but it ultimately goes to a special panel which is chaired by the home secretary who at the moment obviously Priti patel so that's where the decision is made there's an annual review of exactly who should get this type of protection because clearly it's subject to change potentially at any at any point and the issue there as you've mentioned is that if prince andrew isn't going to be representing the country as a member, a senior member of the royal family, then there's an issue over whether the country should pay for his security. I wonder if that, though, brings up implications for Prince Harry and Meghan as they, you know, they've announced they're stepping away from being senior royals. Different situation, but I wonder if the effect could be setting a precedent. Well, it, it could do. Clearly, we don't yet know what this progressive new role that they're seeking is going to involve, and it does appear that it may involve some royal duties. So at least for that part of it, they may receive some form of protection. And clearly, it's also the case that Prince Harry is a bit closer to the, the throne, more high profile than uh, print than his uncle Prince Andrew so from that point of view it's possible that there may be a desire to retain it and obviously he served in Afghanistan and so clearly there's a higher level of threat potentially to, to Prince Harry always has been but if he's not performing any public duties anymore if that happens then perhaps you can expect to see a change in his status as well Next Some of the congressmen may have a vote and I don't it's on the impeachment hoax so if you want you go out and vote and vote those congress members did Donald Trump's impeachment trial is going ahead the house has passed H res 798 a resolution appointing and authorizing managers for the impeachment trial of Donald John Trump, President of the United States. The President is not above the law. He will be held accountable. He has been held accountable. He has been impeached. They can never erase that. The reason for this impeachment is the same reason it's taken Democrats 30 days to send the articles to the Senate. Just spite. They wanted to stain the President's record without giving him a fair chance to clear his name. It's not going to matter because it's going very well. They have a hoax going on over there. Let's take care of it. And what a job you've done. So I just want to thank you all. Really tough. I love that. Well, they did it eventually. After voting to impeach Donald Trump on December the 18th, the U.S. Congress finally sent the papers for the trial to begin last night. Mr. Trump will become only the third U.S. president in history to face a legal challenge to his office. In theory, he could be kicked out. In practice, probably not. Our U.S. correspondent David Garden has been watching events over there. David, Nancy Pelosi signed this off with a bit of a Hollywood flourish, and she's not being subtle about how she thinks the president acts, is she? Well, Hollywood came to Washington rather improbably with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi invoking the Irishman, a mafia movie of all things, uh, when signing off on the articles, the articles of impeachment against Donald Trump in a comparison, I guess, of Mr Trump to a mob boss. The President of the United States, in using appropriated funds, funds that were meant to help the Ukraine fight the Russians, President considered that his private ATM machine, I guess, and said he could say to the president, do me a favor. Do me a favor. Do you paint houses too? What is this? Do me a favor. In the movie, a character played by Al Pacino uses the phrase, you paint houses, don't you? While talking to a character played by Robert De Niro, who's supposed to be a kind of hitman. The phrase refers to killing people basically. So what happens now David? It's been a while since this whole impeachment affair started but it's started to ratchet up a few gears. If there's Godfather part one and part two this is going to be impeachment part one and part two. The first part pretty straightforward in the House of Representatives was led by the Democrats but impeachment part two goes to the Senate. The Republicans are in control there they call the shots and it's extremely likely that Mr Trump will be acquitted. 
but there's plenty of theatre before that. The Senate trial will be um, ruled over by the Chief Justice John Roberts, who on Tuesday will call all 100 senators on an um, oath of impartiality. That's not going to happen. They'll all be ignoring that one. The Republicans have already said quite clearly that they will be siding with the President, um, breaking that oath even before it was taken. And so it will be something of a show trial. And speaking of Donald Trump, remember this. You may have heard there was a dust-up involving yours truly and presidential contender Donald Trump. There was blood coming out of her eyes, blood coming out of her wherever. Oh, my God. But... Did he just accuse me of anger menstruating? Wait, am I going to be the story? No. No. I'm going to be the story. No. no. That's Charlie's Theron as Fox News host Megyn Kelly with a recreation of that moment during the Republican primaries. It's from her new movie, Bombshell, which looks at the allegations of sexual harassment filed against Fox News founder Roger Ailes. Well, the Evening Standards, Katie Rosinski interviewed Charlie's. And Katie, how did an actress known for her strong feminist roles find a way to play the part of Megyn Kelly, who once proudly proclaimed she's not a feminist? Well, when I spoke to her, something that was really interesting that she said was she kind of channeled the fact that even like a few years ago, she didn't feel like she could actually identify as a feminist herself. If Megan was just a feminist and we were watching a feminist fight this, there's really no conflict in that, right? But there is something about Megan Kelly, and she says this very proudly, and I, by the way, I relate to it. For many years, I couldn't call myself a fem feminist because it was one of those dirty words that nobody wanted to use. But she still um, feels very proud of the fact that she's not a feminist, and yet she's, she's part of a story that will be marked in history forever, hopefully for the greatest change for women in workplace. I mean, as you mentioned, like, one of the really interesting things about the film is within like the first five minutes, Megan says, you know, I'm a lawyer, I'm not a feminist. And so it kind of makes the whole, the whole story a little bit more complex because it's not this straightforward, like, you know, feminists taking on sexual harassment it is kind of a bit more um clouded in that in that way as an actress who's very opposed to megan kelly's views i wonder how difficult it was for charlize to step into her shoes well when i spoke to her she mentioned that um although obviously they you know kind of sit on probably quite opposing ends of the political spectrum charlie said that she's seen you know, similar cases in, in her industry, in the film industry. So that was kind of her way in to approaching the character. I relate to another woman who is strong and who is a hard worker and has ambition and drive and wants to be successful in her workplace. And to hear of her story and Gretchen Carlson's story and so many women at Fox and also women outside of those industries and my own industries, where I have seen those things be turned around and weaponized against women. That was something that I could really emotionally tap into. And it's a movie that's very much of the moment right now, following the, the Me Too movement. And of course, what happened at Fox with Roger Ailes um, was very much part of that. It's one of the first, if not the first, Me Too movies, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Um, the case is actually really interesting because it kind of predates all the discussion around um, sexual harassment in Hollywood. So the Fox case broke in 2016, and then um, this film actually went into development in summer 2017, which was like still a couple of months before, you know, the New York Times and the New Yorker broke a lot of the um, allegations around um, sexual harassment in Hollywood. Um, so yeah, it's it's really interesting and I think that it could maybe, you know, open the doors for more kind of film representations of stories like this. Did you get the impression that Charlize thought that it was a trailblazing movie? Um, I think so, yeah. So she mentioned that she actually played another role that was centred around like a landmark sexual harassment case. You know, I did a film in 2004 called North Country that happened in, in, um, in 89. And you would think, and there had then since been subsequent, there's been, you know, a lot of landmark cases like that in, in the world of sexual harassment. And yet none of them have ever really changed things in a way where women can really truthfully talk about their work environments not being toxic. I think having this 
this conversation so actively happening in real time with a film like this, I think has some real power behind it. I think if this film came out five years ago with none of that, I don't know how powerful it would be, but I think the fact that everybody is talking about these issues right now and women are really at the forefront of it, not the men, and that we've seen real consequences for bad actions, I think that's been a really empowering thing and an encouraging thing for women to realize that this isn't all for nothing. And you've seen the movie, haven't you? Is that any good? Yeah, I actually really enjoyed it. It's um, it's very similar to films like Vice and The Big Short in terms of its treatment of the subject. And um, you've got these really amazing three central performances from the three leads. So you've got um, Charlize as Megyn Kelly. Her transformation is really quite uncanny. You've got Nicole Kidman as Gretchen Carlson and then you've got Margot Robbie who plays Kayla who's this fictional Fox News worker who I think is is kind of a composite of a lot of the stories that women at Fox told but I think she kind of represents all the women you know working at the company who did experience this awful stuff but they just didn't have like the platform and the profile to be able to speak out because you know if they lost their jobs they probably weren't going to get a massive settlement they were just gonna lose their livelihood and um, lose a place in the industry that they loved and you can see Katie's interview with Shelley's online at standard.co.uk slash showbiz or at the Evening Standard YouTube channel and that's the leader please subscribe comment like and share us through your podcast provider we're back tomorrow at four